You are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZWLP Conroe and 106.1 KZCCLP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. Hey, this is Dick from Lone Star Community Radio. We have a big announcement for Lone Star Community Radio and our listeners. We have partnered with another TV station. That's right. You'll be seeing Lone Star Community Radio content on KVQT Channel 12 in the Houston area. Now is a great time to start a show or sponsor a show with Lone Star Community Radio. For more information on everything that is happening, visit us online at IRLoneStar.com or call the station at 936 647 3776 and leave a message. And we want to also wish everyone a safe and happy Thanksgiving. All right, got that Texas boogie woogie as the Charles. It's Friday, folks. Giddy up. Saddle up and giddy up and have a good old time. Good morning, Montgomery County. You are so lucky, I'm on fire. Natan Arrasate es en fuego, man. It's Friday. You know the routine. I'm crazy every day, but Friday I'm off the chain. Dick Schistler is in the house as the engineer. So we have, like, the head guru here. We've got some incredible guests here, but you got me. And I left Boudreaux at home, you know, but I got a little Boudreaux attitude. Good morning, man. I got to do it. Good morning, the Woodlands. Good morning, Magnolia. Good morning, uh, Montgomery. Good morning, Tamina. Good morning. Hey, the camera. There you go. How you doing? Hey, good good morning. How you doing? Bunch of dead gun rednecks out there. And we also got to say good morning to New Waverly, Willis, Splendora, New Caney, Cleveland, Kingwood, Humble, downtown Conroe, Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1. Yep. And my favorite and your favorite, good morning, cut and shoot, Texas. We're men are men and sheep are dead gum happy. I know. I'm going to get in trouble for that one. I'll pay the price on that one. That's good. And good morning, Afghanistan. I got to go back online. I got to get with Jake. I got to find out if we still have that listener in Afghanistan. I hope we do. We got listeners all over the world. Uh, a lot of places, there are places where we have troops. So I got a feeling that we've got troops or we've got uh, maybe we've got some um, uh, contractors out there. You know, out there in the sandbox playing and stuff like that. So, but good morning to you. We appreciate you. All right. What the heck is going on Friday? Well, we've got Fearless Boxing is having their first fight night in their new location. They just moved a couple of yards over, folks. They're at 1216 South Frazier next to Tejas Bingo. I've never been down there, played any bingo. I've got some friends that have won some money. I just think I'd be over there dobbing stuff and I'd give my money away. 1216 South Fraser. It's about four times bigger than they used to have. They're still taking care of our youth. Uh, I've been gone for three or four months. You can look at my belly and you can tell. So I'm going to get back in it. Um, got a great program. Cardio boxing. You don't have to get in the ring. I'm not going to get in the ring other than, you know, hitting the, the mitts. 40 bucks a month, dude. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 in the morning, 630 in the evening. And that includes Zumba if you want to. I'm telling you, I look good when I do Zumba. I got the moves, baby. So, so all you... That people out there like me and just those that want to get that heart going again, get on up over there, Fearless Boxing, and check it out. But tonight, I will be your master of ceremonies and your ring announcer. We have 12 bouts, amateur boxing, here in Conroe, first time in their new location. So uh, think about coming out there. Doors open at 6, show starts at 7. We have one young man who just turned 8 years old, so he just got to sign up and be part of USA Boxing. And it is... Uh, Golly, is it Staff Sergeant? Don't get mad at me. I don't remember if it's Staff Sergeant. Lance Gerving, United States Army. It's his son. And he is fired up and ready to giddy up and get it going over there. So come on out and see that tonight and support it. Uh, Congressman Brady, my buddy. I know. I don't call him dude in public, but he said I can call him dude as long as, you know, it's we're not on the House floor. My buddy, my dude, Congressman Kevin Brady, Chairman of the House Ways and Means, has an open house tomorrow morning. Montgomery County Lifestyle has shared that. Go see him. Go get on the phone banks. Go pick up some campaign material. They got a campaign every two years, so so he'll need your help. He's done great. The House just passed some uh, reform on taxes yesterday. So go ask him questions. Go find out. Go see Christian and my buddy Craig and stuff like that. 
And um, there's a few other things going on. Go to Montgomery County Lifestyle Facebook page, and I'll share that out there. Here's the big thing. Salvation Army, Thanksgiving Day, Thursday, 1030 to 2. They're back. They're bigger and better than ever. They haven't served Thanksgiving lunch in a couple of years, but they're back. The Friends of Conroe has saddled up alongside of them, and it's their show. They're the lighthouse, but we're just happy and proud that we get to help support them in that endeavor. We will be cooking. Uh, we're going to buy 80 turkeys today, 20-pound turkeys. We uh, have got the green beans already, got the carrots already. We're picking up the uh, 250 boxes of stuffing. Uh, we're looking, putting a call out for desserts. Sign Up Genius is out for people to sign up. We've got about half our volunteers there. You want to donate and sponsor and put in some money? Great, we'll take it. But we're not pushing that as much as here's what we need. We need, if you're listening to this today live or you hear this on, on the podcast, we need hungry people. We need people that have hungry bellies. That doesn't mean they're so broke and so poor that they can't afford a meal. There's people this year more than ever, they got the money for a meal, but their heart, they don't have any hope this year. Heart's broken. Their mind, their body, their soul, they just... Hurricane Harvey, something. Something's happened this year, and it's a rough year for so many people. Bring them. Let us serve them. Let us love on them. Let us make them laugh. Boudreaux's going to be there. I'm working on getting some real clowns, just not Boudreaux. We're going to have a kid's area. We're just going to have fun and be lighthearted. Maybe you know some people that can't come, and they're just going to sit at home and drink a beer and eat some nachos and watch some football. Come pick up lunch for them. You don't need to prove anything. You don't need to tell us who it's going to. Come pick up lunch. We're going to have food for 2,500 people. Think about that. We'll probably have six to 800 over there. Come pick up food. You got a family next door to you? Come pick up lunch for them. Come pick up dinner for them. Okay? If you're an organization in East County, Jim Clark, Commissioner, spread the word. Uh, 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 Charlie Riley, Magnolia, James Nowak, Woodlands, uh, Mike Matter. And everybody in between, all the constables, all the chiefs of police and fire people, dude, you know people in need, come pick up food. You need to pick up 100 plates for your organization, pick them up, okay? So spread the word. This year, we need to offer hope, and hope can come in the form of a freaking meal and a hug. Simple as that. So, hey, that's it. That's my Pollyanna. Uh, I tell you what, I hope you enjoyed the show we had Wednesday. Uh, go back and look at it as that as that YouTube video comes out. Some interesting, I don't want to say allegations, but some in- interesting um, things, processes that might need to be tweaked over at the Montgomery County Alamo Shelter. Don't know it, haven't been there, but some things were brought up. So if you're involved in stuff like that, just partner up with the shelter. Make sure everybody's on the same page. Make sure everybody knows what's going on. It's for the betterment of our community that we work together, not against each other. So... All right, we're going to take a break right now, and when we come back, you're going to get to listen to somebody besides me, Staff Sergeant James Holland, United States Marine Corps, wearing a Houston Astros cap, got a beard and mustache. Okay, his mustache beats mine, but my beard, I look like Santa Claus, so I'm just saying, you know. When we come back, we're going to have a very interesting uh, story and a pretty serious story. So we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty and, 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 and talk about it. You're listening to Montgomery County Lifestyle with Nathan Arizadi on Lone Star Community Radio. Conroe's FM 104.5, FM 106.1. See you in a minute. Our talk shows and music shows are looking for sponsors. Want to expand your brand awareness? Reach the hyper-local audience in Montgomery County? Lone Star Community Radio sponsorships accomplish this. Want to see our stats and rates? Check out IRLoneStar.com slash sponsor for more information. Or call in and leave us a message at 936-647-3776. Hey guys, I'm Joey Savage. Corey DLG. We are Nerd Thug Radio. Catch us every Monday from 1 to 3 and check out our website, NerdThugRadio.com. We like to talk about quilting, horseback riding, and baking quiche. Actually, we don't, but we do like talking nerdy to you. That's right. Every Monday from 1 to 3 p.m., hashtag talking nerdy to you. Listen to that boogie woogie, man. Got to get you going in the morning. I got one of my guests over here, Gary Buckley. He can sing. I've heard him sing the Star Spangled Banner. And he's dancing, but I'm telling you, he is not smooth. He does not have the moves. Those old creaky bones, they just don't move like they used to. By the way, I got put in Facebook jail this morning. Here I am sharing. The turkey feast 
with my pages. They're my pages, and they're pages that I'm admin on, and they said I shared too much. I was, I was illegal, so they shut me down. They put me in Facebook jail for an hour. I can't believe that. So I'm out of jail now, though. All right, folks, let's dive right in over here. I've got Mr. Gary Buckaloo, a good friend, uh, an advocate to many, to all, but especially to the veteran uh, community. And um, he is part of, he is Calvary Still Ministries. Welcome, Gary. As usual, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Gary, tell us again real quick. Every time you come on, tell me real quick about Calvary Still. Uh, We are a a ministry that uh, helps provide uh, counseling for those veterans that come home and and the reality of the struggle of post-traumatic stress. And uh, what we do is once they start coming to grips with how difficult it is to function, they come to us uh, no matter how they get here. And we're allowed to uh, help them get to the Refuge Trauma Treatment Center for EMDR therapy or over to Henry's home for uh, equine therapy there. And then we just help them to learn how to live a lifestyle of recovery in Christ because like any wound, it goes on and on. It doesn't go away. It's an awesome opportunity, folks. Go to Facebook. Go check out CS Ministries. Go check out the Refuge. They're not on Facebook, but they're down on North Fraser. You can get information from Calvary Still Ministries. Check out Henry's Home. Henry's Home will be on. Uh, we were going to have him in here December. We may or may not do that. We may wait till January, but we're going to get Henry's Home in here. And Gary brings us a topic, a story, maybe a guest or two every month, the last Friday of every month. Tune in for that. Look for that. Again, you all know that for about three months I was hit and miss, and I wasn't able to take care of this because family medical situations, but we're back every Wednesday and Friday. And worst-case scenario, we'll tape it on a Monday or a Thursday or Saturday, and we're going to really try to get real consistent about those Wednesdays and Fridays because this is for you folks. This is community radio. So, Gary, do me a favor. we got a very special guest I was able to go online and read a little bit about Staff Sergeant uh, Holland here. His wonderful wife is in the house. We get to talk to her in a little bit. Yep. She's a whole lot prettier than the three of us, so you will like when we bring her on. Plus, she's just, just, she's a good woman, got a great heart. So take it away and tell us about and introduce. Well, I got a a phone call from uh, the other day from uh, from Angela saying, "Hey, you know, I've heard what's going on." It was given to uh, I think it was uh, uh, Ashley that helped kind of connect us in Tri County, uh, Tri County, yep. and yep. Uh, and uh, it just. You know, one thing led to another. We finally connected, and I started kind of looking at his story, and I'm like, oh, man, this is I, – I, we've heard some bad ones here, right here on the radio. We've heard some bad ones. But when I start digging into this man's uh, uh, struggle and, and how things compounded and how the Lord has brought him back home to, to Houston from where they were from, it was just an amazing deal. And just to be able to have the ability to say, hey, you know, here's my hand. We, we might be able to help you out here. Your heart's in the right place. Uh, you deserve better than what you've received, and let's move forward. But uh, just it's a tremendous story, and because of that, I, I'd like to just go ahead and introduce him, uh, Staff Sergeant James Holland, United States Marine Corps. Uh, I'm just glad that uh, we hooked up and he's here. So I'll turn the mic over to you, sir. Absolutely. Well, uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you for having me. This is awesome, uh, amazing. Thank you for letting me uh, give me a platform to, to get this out there. A um, little bit of my background, you know, I was uh, born in Pasadena, Texas. Oh, good. Stink of Dina. Uh, that, that's yeah. it. Pass to get down Dina, right? Dude, yeah. I, I went to Dobie High School up until okay. my sophomore year, and I moved up here. All right, all right. So, Stutzbury, yeah. Stutzbury, George A. Thompson. Yeah, yeah. So, you know the area down there. So, uh, I enlisted out of Houston in January of 2000. Uh, enlisted as an infantryman. I uh, went to MCRD San Diego. Uh, ended up at uh, in California for uh, second time, uh, first Marines. I was there for five years, and then I went to uh, – a stint on the depot as a drill instructor. I uh, did that for three years, and then in 2008, I decided to go to the East Coast and do a, a little stint over there with the 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines. During that time, that was 12 years in Marine Corps right there, uh, during which time I did uh, three combat deployments to, Af- uh, to, to Iraq and two to Afghanistan. Uh, suffered quite a, f- quite a few concussions from IED blasts and things. Uh, when I gotten out, kind of what led me to get out, because people ask all the time, how do you do 12 years, three months, and then get out of the Marine Corps, right? Um, I had a lot of those concussions. They, it's they, a different time. Right. They built up. Uh, I it was, it was kind of a different person, right? And I started to notice certain things uh, about memory and things like that. So there was talk about me not being able to deploy as an infantryman anymore. Well, you know, that's why I joined that gun club, was being an infantryman. So it's time for me to move on. I got offered a good job, uh, you know, working, kind of doing the same thing I was doing as a staff sergeant, uh, 
just doing it as a civilian. So I was going to be on a military base. You know, it was a great job. I was like, all right, it's a good opportunity. I can still be around Marines every day, and uh, we can do our business. Uh, along that time, I, I did sustain an injury uh, outside of combat. It was on uh, the drill field as a drill instructor. I had injured my shoulder. I had uh, torn the labrum. Now, at the time, you know, drill instructors, we work a lot, right? So uh, it was kind of the NFL program. It was like, well, you can go get surgery, but you can't be a drill instructor anymore. Or we can put you on this program over here where you get cortisone shots about every three weeks, and we stretch your arm out. So, you know, you know which one I chose, right? Being a Marine, I chose chose to get the cortisone shots and push on. Not the smart decision. Oh, right, right. <laughs> so I uh, kind of nursed his shoulder on and off over the years. And then uh, after I got out in 2012, I re-injured it and showed up to the VA, you know, because I was no longer in. So I showed up to the VA, and they, they did some x-rays and said, oh, yeah, you got quite a bit of damage in there, not just the labor anymore. So like, well, we got to put you on a waiting list. We don't have an orthopedic surgeon at the time. So that was uh, February. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That was March of 2012. So I got the call last year uh, around October. Uh, I said, hey, guess what? So March of 2012, and this is where I get rowdy. Because I've heard the stories, and I've met some people. But this, this one, when I reached it, this is, this is crap. It, it March took a of while. 2012. And so every couple of months, are you saying, what's up? And they're like, oh, I don't have an orthopedic surgeon. Yes. Whatever. So, right. Jeez. So it, it Congressman starts off. Congressman Brady, man, I hope you're listening, dude. So it starts off, um, you know, it, it, get, it starts off on pain medication. They give you some pain meds to get through it. And, you, you know, I, I'm back on the band, so I'm kind of nursing it back to life. Um, well, I had re-injured it again uh, January of 2016. I would re-injured it, and now it was at a How'd point where— that? It was a motorcycle wreck. I had a motorcycle accident um, and went down another concussion. Last thing I need, right? <laughs> another head injury. So anyways, uh, but what had happened was I I'd, I'd injured the shoulder to a point where I couldn't even sleep at night. Yeah. You know, it was just, it was nonstop pain. So now I'm, I'm beating down the door every day and I'm saying, listen, we have to do something. So the VA's idea, they said, well, listen, we still don't have any, any slots for you to get surgery right now. We do have this program uh, that's going in place, the choice program. So we might be able to get you out in town. They said, right now, the best thing we can probably push you towards is a program down at UCLA Medical Center called uh, Operation Mend. They deal with uh, PTSD, TBI, uh, which I was diagnosed with on, on my way out the door of the Marine Corps. They diagnosed me with TBI and PTSD. Uh, and they said they can, they can help you deal with those things as well as if you have any injuries, they'll help with those. So we thought, wow, this might be the answer to all our problems. You know, So I talked it over with the wife. We contacted UCLA Medical Center. Um, operation men, they said, yeah, you guys are a perfect match. Let's do this. So we thought, okay, how long does this take? Well, you might be down here for, you know, several months, three months. I said, okay, well, I don't want to pay rent on a house for three months and live down in UCLA. So our plan is to put everything in storage and we'll come down there and, uh, we'll link up and we'll get this thing going. So that's what we did. Put it all on the line. Uh, me and my wife, we took the three year old and we loaded up, went from Oregon down to California. So we check in there. Uh, we go through the whole procedures. They they say, oh, you guys are perfect. We're going to take you. This is on a Friday. Say, so you guys go out, have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Well, come back on Monday and the weekends when the lawyers get involved. Well, there's a little law in California about squatters. And if you don't have a home, the hospital won't take you in. Because if you don't feel like leaving, they technically can't kick you out. So they basically told us on Monday, we're sorry, but we can't take you in because you no longer have a home. And we said, well... I had a home, but you guys told me to pack everything up and come down here. So their plan was for us to drive back up to Oregon, get back in a home, and then drive back down to UCLA and go through the program. Well, you know, I, I, I couldn't take that. So I basically told them, you know, you see me again, you need to run. Uh, I'm not going to be coming back down. So we loaded up, went back up to Oregon, got back into a house. This is all on our own dime now. We get back into a home. Uh, I start looking for work again because I had to, you know, stop working to go down for this program. Start looking for work again. It goes about two months. I finally get a phone call from the VA. Say, hey, Mr. Allen, this is great news. We can do the surgery. We can do it here. We're going to put you on the choice program. We'll get a doctor out in town to do it. I thought, well, that sounds great, but you guys just ran me up and down the coast, and I'm kind of short on funds here. I, you know, I'm a little worried about money. And they said, don't worry about it. You're perfect for the disability program. That's why we have state disability for guys like you. You've been paying into it, you know, since you've had a job. This is perfect. We'll sit you down. We'll even schedule the appointment. So they locked it all on, me, my wife, and daughter. We went, matter of fact, I believe it was Halloween of last year. We went and sat down, filled all the paperwork out. They said, this is perfect for you. You can finally get your surgery. 
So we thought, all right, you know, looking about 10 weeks of healing up, it'll cover us, it'll float us, and then I can go back to work. We're no big deal. Got the surgery on January 10th. Got a letter in the mail on January 14th. I was denied disability. So that's where the financial problems started. On you did top, it on the 10th, and you got a letter that quick? Uh, I did it on October 31st oh, okay. is when I submitted, and I got the letter uh, January 14th. I got I'm sorry. All right, so. Uh, but he did have the surgery. <laughs> yeah, I did have the Four surgery. Four days after the surgery, he yeah. gets a letter yeah. saying, hey, thanks yeah. for your time. Correct. So uh, another issue that we had was. Um, Not so, Texas, if I might interject. You know, that I was didn't just about to say that. Texas. I was just about to say that. that <laughs> I was letting you talk, but I was going to back up. Right. You were in. Okay, so you you were living where? In Oregon. Okay, and then you they wanted you to go to California. Correct. They wanted me okay. to shoot down to California, down to UCLA. And Medical so that Center. was the program there. Right. Okay. Why were you in Oregon? Uh, you're from, I, you're I, from I, Texas, man. Right. So I'd left, uh, when I'd gotten out of the Marine Corps, I'd gotten the offer of that contract. It was at uh, 29 Palms, California. Cool. I get right? it. Okay. So this was back in 2014. Now, there was rumors about us, you know, a lot of the contracts starting to dry up, and we're going to start handing things back over to the, to the military to do. So I started thinking, if this contract stuff dries up, you know, I've only been an infantryman for the last 12 years. There's not too many jobs out there for me. So I started looking for a career. I, I uh, got lucky enough getting a job with FedEx Ground up there in, uh, in Oregon. So that's what took me up there. Cool. Was uh, I got offered an operations manager uh, position up there. So that's what got us to Oregon. Uh, so, yeah, that's where we were during okay. this whole process during the, uh, the surgery. So the surgeon, during the surgery, when he gets in there, he looks and he goes, man, I, I'm sorry, but you had so much scar tissue. You know, because it was four years, 11 months is what it took for the surgery. He says, I tried to cut away so much scar tissue, but I couldn't do much in there. And he's like, yeah, the arthritis I saw on your shoulder as well, is it's really bad. He's like, so you're going to have a rough time healing. So he's like, I'm going to I'm gonna prescribe you this certain cuff. Uh, you take it to the VA. It shouldn't be a big deal. They'll give you the prescription for it. And it's basically going to it's gonna allow you to move your arm kind of in and out, you know, kind of away from your body. And, and it keeps it moving um, slightly. Uh, so I take that to the VA. They, uh, primary care, you know, takes it in, says, I think we need to get this guy this cuff. And they say, okay, we're going to send it up to orthopedics. You know, you'll hear from us within the next two weeks. Well, within the next two weeks, of course, I get a phone call to come in and come get a cuff. I think I'm getting this cryo cuff. And instead, they give me a different one. They kind of just, it basically, it straps my arm to my torso, right? So my arm is, is strapped to my torso for, for eight weeks. genetic, you know, yeah, right. I've seen them all. They had... Very generic, yeah. right? I think you can get them in, in CVS. Or, yeah. yeah. So, so anyways... Uh, so that thing, my arm's strapped to my, to my body for, for eight weeks. I go in about the middle of February. The surgeon takes, takes it out of the strap, and it, it wants to go maybe three inches in each direction. That's about it. So it's completely frozen. I can't use it. And this is my dominant arm. Um, so here we are thinking, you know, I got about another two weeks of recovery, and then I'm going back to work. Well, that just changed, right? And uh, the whole time, we're still appealing the whole disability process. Um, one thing leads to another. The VA, you know, the VA, they work in 90 days, six months, nine months. They work in, in segments like that where, you know, Bank of America and other things like that, they work in 30 days, right? We got to pay our bills every 30 days. So, you know, the, the funds dried up after a while, to say the least. Uh, we ended up in some transitional housing there in the VA, up there in Oregon, trying to get it all uh, figured out. One thing led to another, and our time ran out there because they only allow six months at a time for families. So our six months ran up, and uh, funds were dry. So that's what brought us back down to the Houston area, obviously family. So we fell back on family. Um, I guess what uh, people ask, what took you so long to get down here? What took you so long to get to Texas? You're going to get taken care of in Texas as a veteran. It's harder than you think to transfer uh, all that Well, that and we, care. it's easy for us to say. I mean, it's a pride thing. We think we can take care of you. We think right. our VA is better. And maybe it is, but it's it's – I think it's more it's of an issue I've, that they won't let go in that state that they're in. That, well, it's one thing I posted on Facebook recently was be careful when you're talking to somebody that, that's that's in, going through an issue, even though you went through the same issue. And the point I made was, oh, I know what you're going through. No, you don't. You might know what you went through. Right. He might be dealing with it differently. Okay. So I just I, people just need to be careful. But they probably meant, well, dude, we'll take care of you. Right. It's Texas, you know. And. And that's the problem is it is it is Texas. So I will say this, that the, the, the people down here generally care a whole lot more at the VA. They, they sit there and they're like, let's get to the bottom. Let's, let's figure this out. Where up there, it was a little more like, oh, yeah, that's kind of the way it goes. You, you know, so that's the difference. Um, I will say the biggest thing that I've run into is because is, uh, during this journey, it's obviously it's brought me and my wife 
together with some other veterans, um, a whole lot of, especially my generation, OEF, OIF, who are running into this same problem. So they're, they've been on a waiting list for one or two years or three years. They've had to move on. They've had to get a job. You know, maybe they even have a, a wife now and a kid. Now they're getting that call and they're saying, hey, we're, you know, we want, want to let you know we have this great program called the Choice Program now, so we're able to get you a surgery. Well, this guy might have a new job now. He's like, well, my job's not going to let me take the next 90 days off. You know, I didn't get injured on their, on their dime. I got injured on the government's. So they're having to say no. You know, maybe you can get me in a few months. Well, when you say no to that, the VA, you're going to the bottom of the bottom of the list, you know. Um, the other option is they set you down and they say, no, don't worry about it. This is, you're perfect. This is what the whole disability program is for. It's for people just like you. And you go and you say, okay, let's do it. And then you get denied. Well, that's what happened to us. So these are the two things that are happening to vets right now. And I think it's important to know that not every veteran is getting treated this way, but it's also important to know that it happens a heck of a lot more than just your voice. There's a hundred people behind you that have the same generic story, right? probably more. But you're the voice for so many. People need to realize that this isn't one guy out there screaming or crying. This happens all the time across America. And if I may interject, then you have to add the layer of he's not just it's bad enough to deal with the stress of what's going on with everything else. Now you add to the fact that this is a combat veteran with the struggles and the emotional anxieties that carry with it when you live a normal life. And if people wonder why the suicide rate is so high. Just take a look. There's a reason for it. Because what happens is we start to think that, okay, the reason that my family's not succeeding, the reason that things aren't happening is because I am a burden. Yep. And the right. best, would take, we, best way to do, best thing to do in their eyes is to get rid of that burden. So. All right, folks, you're listening to Montgomery County Last Night with Nathan Arizati, Staff Sergeant Holland. We're coming back. We're bringing his lovely wife on. So go get some water or coffee and get your butt back. We'll be right back. Lone Star Community Radio presents the Lone Star Radio Troop. This talented cast will perform radio plays right here in the Lone Star Studios located in downtown Conroe. There will be a new performance every first Sunday of the month. And if you miss the broadcast, just go to Lone Star Community Radio's podcast or YouTube anytime during that month. Go to our LoneStar.com archives to find the Lone Star Radio Troop's latest play that's available. This is Lone Star Community Radio, Conroe's 104.5 FM and 106.1 FM Community Station. Find us on the web at IRLoneStar.com. Lone Star Community Radio is a supporter to the performing arts in Montgomery County, Texas. Remember to download the Lone Star Community Radio app from your Google Play Apple Store. Bring Montgomery County's Community Radio with you anywhere with your smartphone or tablet. If you are in the Conroe area, tune in on FM 104.5, 106.1. If you are on your computer, bookmark IRLoneStar.com as your internet radio station. Lone Star Community Radio broadcasting 24-7 from the heart of downtown Conroe, Texas. All right, folks, you're listening to Montgomery County Last with Nathan Arizati. Let's back up here. Where are we? We're on Lone Star Community Radio, your community radio station. What is it? It's Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1. It's FM. You're driving around town. You're driving over to toward the lake area, Willis, Cut and Shoot. You're driving down to 242 area. You can listen to us. Then you've got www.irlonestar.com. If you're at home, you're at work, get on your computer and listen. You can always go to iTunes, Google Play, download the app, listen while you're driving, listen to the podcast, go to the YouTube channel I have on Montgomery County Lifestyle, Lone Star Community Radio, go to their website, our website I should say, and look at that there. A lot of opportunities to listen. Channel 12 Sudden Link next week, coming up soon, Channel 21 in Houston. Yeah, baby, we are not just radio, we're Houston. TV and Conroe TV. All right, let's get back to a very serious um in some ways heart-wrenching, in some ways inspirational, and in some ways tick you freaking off um, story about one of, those, one of those young men who served our country. Um, but the one person that we always forget, I don't want to say always, that a lot of times we overlook 
And that is the family, and that is the spouse, male, female. That is the children. So, Staff Sergeant, introduce your lovely wife, and let's hear from her, kind of going up to, to where you ended off, what she was going through and what she felt. Right, right. So, here's Angela. So, she's, uh, she's that better half, right? She's definitely, uh, you, you always hear the term the rock or something. She holds our stuff together, that's for sure, with my TBI. And uh, my PTSD all over the place. She's definitely the uh, the glue, and um, she so she's got to deal with the whole the other end of the VA, and the other end of uh, of 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 my TBI and PTSD. A lot of those wives, man. I tell you what, the VA you always hear you, you always hear the VA's broken. I mean, forever it seems like that's all we've ever heard is the VA's broken. VA's broken. And, and I had you know a congressman. He was like, well, "What do you think we should do to fix the VA?" I tell you, get about 20 military wives together in a room and give them about two days, and they're going to have most of your problems fixed with VAs. I mean, they're smart. They know what they're doing. She deals with them people nonstop, you know, hours on end throughout the week, and she's really had to figure and, and, and try to figure out how to navigate this, this beast of the VA, and it that's really is difficult. That's interesting you said that. that. That's a cool topic. Maybe, maybe we're going to come back on a show and bring some wives. Okay. That's, that's interesting to hear. That's interesting to hear because – Everybody I've talked to personally or, or as an acquaintance or, or read or watched something on TV or news, 90% of the problem, freaking common sense can fix. Right. It doesn't take a college degree from A&M. It doesn't take, you know, an Ivy League education. We don't need to be a Wharton graduate. I could fix half the crap that I've been a part of and I've seen. It's common sense, right? Absolutely. Um, well, first, I thank you for having me as well. Um, I wanted to just go back to 2012 when he go out to, got out to kind of give perspective from the spouse's point of view. So um, obviously he's coming home a hero to all of us, but now a different man in a lot of sense, diagnosed with TBI, which is traumatic brain injury and PTSD. A lot of the times as a spouse, it's just getting familiar with those acronyms. You hear them a lot. And, um, you know, the spouses are never included. Uh, at least I wasn't in my experience. It was showing up to his appointments and always have the information relayed through him. So my first thing is obviously um, just as a spouse trying to learn about traumatic brain injury and PTSD because it's, it's very complex and it's very hard to understand and it's different with everyone. It definitely doesn't look the same for everyone. So of course we tried um, going to the VA because that's what you're instructed you're to, do. to do. Right. You follow the protocol and sadly for us the protocol, um, protocol is probably the same for a lot of people. It's pharmaceutical based. So that's a huge problem. You have a lot of veterans that never took a pill until they became a veteran. Yeah. Uh, so that definitely adds a different layer to the PTSD and the TBI. In addition, a lot of their um, treatments are cold and clinical, and they do not involve the family, and they do not involve your spiritual core. They don't ask you what you believe or what makes you you. It's the paperwork comes first, and the veteran comes second. So after years and years of you know, following this cold protocol where I feel it even distanced us. I'm, I'm not a part of it. We don't talk about it. Those things are kept between him and his buddies. But yet, you know, I'm seeing the effects of my husband changing our family, um, living a different dynamic, having different stresses that really are very isolating unless you are living it or you know someone that lives it. So, you know, when we got that call, um, Yes, I encouraged him to take the surgery even after I had pushed him to do other programs because exercise, for one, you can't exercise, you can't heal in a lot of these programs, they, especially when you're a physical combat veteran that a lot of your identity comes from, you know, your physical abilities. Um, so we were really encouraged. And to, as a man, mm -hmm. as a Marine, you, right. you personally rate yourself on how much of a man you are. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, what I can do. Oh, I can't lift anything heavy right now. That sounds silly, but that hurts, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, 12 years, yeah, 12 years of being a Marine, and then all of a sudden, you know, I mean, like like, like somebody was asking me, what's your goal? I think it was a doctor was asking me, what's your goal um, for your arm right now? Because they measure, you know, they are constantly doing measurements to see how how, uh, how much movement I have. I, my goal is I want, I'd like to be able to throw a baseball again, you know? I haven't thrown a baseball with my son since uh, the injury happened in 2006. So I can tell you in 2006 was the last time I threw a baseball. You know, I grew up as a kid. Yeah, that's what we did. We played baseball. You take that for you granted. Know? You're right. So just even being able to throw a baseball to my and, son. And to, the, to me right now, I'm looking at you. I'm like, you got an arm. What's the problem? Right. You just moved your arm up here. Dude, right. really? Really? You can't? 
This is leaps That's and bounds right, see, right yeah. It is. And, um, people don't understand it. They don't understand They could understand it better if the arm wasn't there. That's what I was going to say. With, with traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress syndrome, you have men that look completely whole and capable on the outside. And you don't see those dark moments on the inside in the home that's all related to moral injury and things that you can't see. But they definitely present themselves in chronic job loss, anger, isolation, destruction, suicide. Self-medication. Self-medication. Well, and self-medication because it's being given to you yeah. endlessly oh, yeah. Yeah. through the VA. And mm-hmm. I want to touch on something real quick. I don't know if he's listening. He'll listen to Sergeant Adam Berry. He hit something with a good friend of mine down. He got moved to Corpus. He got blown up too many times. You, you hit that? So he had to get out. He can't deploy anymore. He's now regular army attached to the, to the National Guard, but he can't deploy because he was blown up. But he's happy because he didn't get kicked out like others do. Right. But then his old unit got deployed, and they lost five men. And what the men made the mistake of was what he taught and trained all the time. So he went back to the dark hole Mm -hmm. for a couple of months because he said, it's my fault. Right. If I hadn't gotten blown up or told the truth, Mm -hmm. I would have been there to say. And that's something that people don't realize. Just because you're out doesn't mean the trauma stops because not all of your friends are out. Not all Mm -hmm. of your families are out. Well, in the transition, too, I mean, that was probably the first failure right there. It was my, like I told you, I said, I had a job waiting on me. You know, it was going to be there in 14 days. So when I went in for my final physical, you know, when the doc was asking certain questions, if it had anything to do with those four letters, PTSD, I was like, I, I don't want to hear anything about it, doc. You know, I was like, if anything's going to keep me here any longer, you know, I got a job waiting on me. I got to be there in 14 days. So he said, yeah, you're a grown man, staff sergeant. You know, just if you have any problems, go check into the VA. So that was, you know, when. You that's know, what you do. Right. That's what you do. It's and, wrong, but that's what well, you and do. And that's right. part of the failure of the, there was no the good exit process is the family's not included, so you don't have the support system, the wife there, right. taking the information like we do and really bringing it to use in our family. Like I said, I, I didn't know what traumatic brain injury was. I had to figure it out for myself. So when we got that call for the surgery, we had been told over and over, he needs to be physically capable to heal. He needs to be doing yoga. He needs to be doing all these types of things that he can't do because he can't physically exercise. So, of course, I pushed him, and I'm like, let's get the surgery because we need to get you healed. You Did know? he do yoga? Uh, he still can't because he still can't waiting. use his arm. We're still waiting. Unfortunately, the surgery was in January, and he's still under medical care and looking at a secondary surgery. And I believe it stems directly from the issue with VA and VA choice. I mean, that sounds like a great program that – all of the overflow and all of the weight is finally going to be taken care of by these private surgeons that are going to step in and come to the rescue. So that's what we thought. And, you know, we get this prescription for a cryocuff. I mean, what is it, a four to $600 piece of equipment at most? Um, so we take the prescription in and literally, you know, they're arguing because it's not on the right type of stationery. And I'm like, this is one of your VA choice providers here, all of the paperwork. They wouldn't even take his prescriptions for medication. So this program's supposed to be here to rescue and save us. And this program, I believe, directly contributed to the situation that we're in now. It's it's a great program, but if it can't be successfully implemented, then we're still not serving our veterans. Well, and it's not like you, I want to make this clear too, it's not like you came here or you're here now, point and blank. You're here to talk about a story mm-hmm. and bring awareness. And it is their fault. Five years for a freaking surgery right. that I can probably go get in a month, right? probably. Right. I could probably find an orthopedic surgeon to do it in a month if it mm-hmm. was me and I had insurance. Well, my thing is, do, do our elected leaders wait five years? Oh, God, no. Right. So why are our um, combat veterans, our heroes, the ones that are protecting those liberties, having to wait five years, three years? Why are they having to fight a secondary battle when they're coming home and they're supposed to be taken care of and can heal and successfully reintegrate into society and have their families back? And that's not happening. So my sad experience was, you know, coming out of this thinking that sadly they're they're waiting for our older veterans to pass away. And I feel that they are wanting our younger veterans not to be here because then they don't have to take care of them. We literally had a situation where we called from staying at the Fisher House. It was a low moment where we talked about it in the video that we made where um, everything was really overwhelming for us. We didn't know what we were going to do. So we called one of the hotlines. Yeah, and, I did. I was at a, I was at a real mm-hmm. low, low, low point. And I mean, you got to figure out, I have PTSD and my PTSD is not it's not necessarily fear-based. So I, I'm not scared of large crowds or, or booms. I, you know, I'll jump and stuff, but I'm more, it's exhausting because the whole time I'm there, I'm 360 degrees security at all times. If something were to happen, 
here's what I would do. Here's how I would react. So, you know. Uh, uh, so you go to a festival. You're okay going to the festival. You're not right. freaked out of that guy next to you. And right. You're like, oh, God. But, but, but you're I'm always on such looking, high okay, alert. If something happens, I'm going here and I'm right. going there. And, okay, hey, that's good music. Okay, but if, where's, where's my wife? Okay. Right. And ne- two hours never a that. state of complete calm right. or rest. There's no rest. Right. And two or three you're hours. You're taking of that, care you're of everybody exhausted. else and yourself. Correct. And so uh, two or three hours, you're exhausted. So now take away your dominant arm mm-hmm. and put yourself in that situation. Now all of a sudden, I can't take care of myself and my family. I was depressed. I was highly depressed. I was sitting there watching my wife cry. You know, she just got off the phone again with the VA and, and she's crying and bawling. So I hit a low point. I called. You know, they give you the crisis hotlines to call. So I called. And I literally, I tell a lady this, I say, listen, I'm, I'm a combat veteran and, and I'm having a hard time right now. And, and you guys keep passing me around from place to place. And I'm at such a low point. I'm, I'm literally thinking about suck starting this pistol. What are you going to do? And she literally, she asked me, she said, can you wait on hold? And I said, if you think you want to put me on hold, then okay. And so she did. And it was about three minutes and she came back on and she literally gave me the phone number to another place. She wanted me to call them. And I said, let me get this straight. I said, I'm calling you. I'm telling you. That I'm at a low point. I'm thinking about suck starting this pistol because I'm tired of being passed around. And you're trying to give me another number to call someone else in the city of Portland? No, thank you. I hung up. So when we see those articles about someone, you know, in the VA trying to get help and then directly after committing suicide, it hits home in a whole different way. Right. Right. All right. <clears throat> We're going to take one last break. And when we come back, let's speed it up a little bit and let's talk about what's going on now. We're going to have about six minutes. Let's talk about what's going on now. Let's talk about the down and dirty. If you got something hardcore to talk about, something like whatever, this is your last six or seven minutes. What do you want the listeners to know about you or to know about going forward? Is that cool? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. sounds great. Montgomery County Last Hour with Nathan Arizona. Folks, we'll be right back. Lone Star Community Radio is looking for those who are interested in hosting their own talk show. With monthly and weekly slots available on Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and on IRLoneStar.com. Start your own podcast, create your first YouTube channel, and be on TV. Contact Lone Star Community Radio online at IRLoneStar.com or call the message line at 936-647-3776 to take your first step into the radio world. Attention movie lovers. The Ticket Stub is a new radio show servicing Montgomery County that is meant for you. The Ticket Stub is available live every Thursday at noon on FM 104.5 and 106.1, as well as anytime on IRLoneStar.com. Connor and Dick will let you know what's coming out in the theater, what is worth streaming, and what's going on in the world of film. The Ticket Stub, your home for movie talk. Lane. Y'all want me to sing? Because I can do it. Ezra Charles in the works. Beaumont boy. Giddy up. Saddle up. Friday morning. Montgomery County Last Night with Nathan Erzati. We're having a wonderful, wonderful day today. It's a tragic topic. It's a topic that, that stinks. It's a topic that needs to be talked about. But there's a beautiful side to it, too, because there's a side of hope. There's so many things I could ramble on about. But here's one thing that just really grabbed me. When we brought Angela on, I don't know where the cameras were. But I want to go back and see. I watched you too, and I got goosebumps. Look at that. I'm not making this up. You looked at him. I almost started crying. And, and everybody in, in Montgomery County Lifestyle knows that I'm a crier. He knows that I cry. You looked at him with so much love and so much compassion. You looked at her with trust. You looked back at her, and I saw a soft side to your eyes. You, you weren't the combat vet at that moment. I won't beat a dead horse, but guys, I'm telling you, this, that's the beautiful side. Well, is the hope side of it. She's pretty amazing. Yeah. There is the hope side because I I am so proud of my husband uh, just for, for his history and for what he's doing now. I mean, he's he he never gives up. It's, it would be really easy to give up and say, I'm done. But he's pushed further, and he's pushed so deep to, to even come to the point of realization that without faith-based treatment, there's this is a struggle we can't mm-hmm. win. And so really... That's what's bringing us here today is that message of hope and talking about PS Ministries and what they're doing with their program for veterans that includes the family and includes their spiritual core. 
so that they can heal um, on a level that's just not happening um, in, in the VA and other programs. And what's cool about CS Ministries and, and a lot of the programs here, and I'm sure there are other places, but a lot of Montgomery County have come together to not reinvent the wheel. Here's a nonprofit that does this. I need that. I'm not going to copy it. I'm going to send my people there. I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to, we're going to come together as, as like an alliance, as like a coalition to work together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it was great. Um, I mean, the way we found them, we got asked what we got asked last night. How did you even get in contact with them? And I mean, it's such a weird story. Really, I, the only answer was God. Cause, Absolutely. I mean, you want to go ahead and tell how? Um, you know, I was, we've, we've come here still searching for help and still struggling and still not finding the answer, I believe, up until now. And, I, you know, I'm a note taker and a researcher and I had a piece of paper and it was off to the side with CS Ministries on it. And I was just so so down. I said, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to call. I don't think anyone can help us at this point. We're just, I'm just, you know, lost. And that little voice, you know, God was like, pick it up and call. And uh, I called and I had a wonderful conversation and it was the empathy because that's the problem. Like you said, you know, the VA is the VA. It's a system. It's the people that make or break the system. It's the ones that answer the phones and it CS Ministries, they answered the phone and they talked to me and there was no, I didn't feel rushed. And, and we talked about God and we talked about who we were and we talked about what my whole family needed. And to be honest, I haven't had that conversation, I don't think, ever in the, the years that I have been working with the VA. Um, and it really hit me. And so, yeah, I think I know that God brought us to this point. Because oh. without God, you know, the, the veterans stay stuck. Right. Absolutely. Well, we got about four minutes. So between the two of you, bring us up to current. What's going on now? What are you looking at doing? Um, so I'm, you know, I'm currently getting the treatments uh, that I need to try to get my arm better at, at the, at the physical UCDA. therapy, physical therapy and things okay. of that. It Possibly took, a secondary surgery. That right. We're at. It took a, it is wasn't it the Houston VA. It, it is. is the Houston okay. VA. And I will say the Houston VA is better than what we worked with in um, Oregon and Washington. But I think that's because of the people, the systems, right. the system, but the people here in Houston, you know, they do love their veterans. They are a good community and it is a much more family and loving and supportive um, experience than we definitely had in Oregon and Washington. It's still a machine. Still yeah, a machine, though, absolutely. exactly. Machine. And it's still a machine that needs a lot of changes from people um, at the top that are beyond this, that w we want to hear this story so that they know the struggles that veterans um, are facing and the systems are so difficult to navigate and so um, not user-friendly. Um, it's, it's a very confusing, hopeless system. And so if you have the right people and they're pointing you in the right direction, um, that's really what we need. Right. Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, just, just being down here and what we're doing is we don't want this to continue to happen to other vets. That's right. the problem is we're seeing this happen a lot. Like I said, you know, we, we came across a lot of stories and veterans said, yeah, I had to say no to my surgery, you know, and, and, and the thing is, is that veteran's still in pain. You know, he's still going through chronic pain and he's probably, he might be missing, you know, a total of a week or, or a week and a half a month of work due to his chronic pain. So it's still affecting him his marriage, in his life. And his marriage and his family might be suffering. Too. Right, marriage and family might be suffering. And you know, and it was all just due to the fact that he had to say no, so. So then it all spirals out of control. Correct, right. To the point people go, well, he could, but they don't know the whole story. They right. don't, I've had lots of people say, well, you know, you should be working, why aren't you working? First off, you know, um, I'm a stay at home mom and that's a choice I'm entitled to have. Absolutely. And a purpose that I believe God is pushing me towards. and. I'm a VA caregiver in the VA caregiver program to my husband because of his traumatic brain injury. The, the veterans trying to navigate the system on their own is nearly impossible, which is why they drop out unless they have a spouse or a caregiver that can handle the appointments, um, intervene in file issues, work with congressional liaisons, all things I've had to figure out along the way with virtually no support. So uh, him trying to do that without me. And no me, training. And no training. But common sense. But common sense. And I could probably train the people that are working at the VA by now. <laughs> right. Well, in post-surgery, I was averaging about six, six to eight appointments a week is what I was averaging uh, for the first three or four months. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so you throw that in with me not being able to use my dominant arm. I mean, Not she being got, able to drive under the medications that they have them mm -hmm. under as well. Right. Not being able to drive to my appointments. Um <laughs> So she got to a point, you know, we got to a point and she was breaking down. She's like, I think I just have to go to work. And we're like, what are we going to do? Put the kid in the high chair for eight hours? <laughs> like, you know, it, we really didn't know. And, and that's kind of what we got here. My brother, you know, my brother, he's, he's in law enforcement. He, he stayed down here in the Texas area and he was talking to me. He's like, what are you going to do? And we had a point where we don't know. I don't know. Sometimes you have to turn it over to God, which right. is what we ended up doing. And God brought us to where we need to be, which is here with 
PS Ministries and your and my husband's family. And uh, back. So home. where do you live now? Um, right now we are in Houston with his family. Okay. Mm-hmm. No, we're staying with family while I'm trying to get the. Uh, well, we're just now getting the services going and started. Like I said, it wasn't an easy transition. No, you know when you transfer to state to state with the services, they don't start. You know the next week. It's about two to three months um, uh-huh. turnover. That's a whole other issue. <laughs> right. So, what's the next step for you? Uh, just continuing this treatment with this arm, and and then maybe a surgery. Yes, we're. Are you on a waiting list, or the doctors are trying to decide if it'll help? They're still trying to decide. They're still getting me in for more MRIs and just okay. looking at the arm because it just it, it hasn't healed properly. It's still you know not working. And here's what's pain. crazy: there's probably no no way of knowing is is it an incompetent doctor team, or is it the machine that don't want to make a decision? Because I still go back and say if I went and got an MRI today, it would get read over the weekend because somebody else reads it, and I could probably be in to see my surgeon on Wednesday, and he or she would say we can do this. Or we can't do that. Right. But I guarantee you, if my MRA was today, I would know what was going to happen next week. Yes or no? Oh, absolutely. Any doctor out there can't tell me that I wouldn't know right. in less than a week. And he's had probably four MRIs this year. See, that's stupid. <laughs> in MRIs. different states, and they so don't transfer If they can't them. do it, then just tell you they mm-hmm. can't do it, right? right? So you can move on and figure out another way. Right. Yeah. Okay, see, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's no, that's the anger in me. Yeah, yeah that's, well, that's the cycle that they put you in. And imagine, you know, being a veteran with those conditions not being able to handle that frustration or process it and this is what happens okay what do you want people to know in 60 seconds or less between the two of you i would say in 60 seconds or less that in order to really have a successful healing experience for your family you're going to have to incorporate god non-pharmaceutical treatments and the whole entire family i just like to you know the other veterans that are out there listening you know they're not alone there, there's guys out there that that maybe they got a 10 percent rating for PTSD, and so the, the VA doesn't want to give them any services for that, but, you know, and they rate a whole lot more. You're not alone. You know, call. Call some people. There's some guys. CS Ministries is right here. Give a phone call. Thank you for being here. Thank you Thank for you. sharing your story, and we're going to have spouses on mm-hmm. next month or yeah. a month after. I'm soon I can do, absolutely. We wish you the best. We're going to replay this, and hopefully your voice is out there. We'll talk more offline. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Montgomery County Lifestyle, thanks you for letting us come into your life. Go have a great weekend. Go love others and go love some veterans. Nathan Ayers, I'm Montgomery County Lifestyle reminding you this is your county, your life. Go live it with style. Thanks for checking out this podcast of Lone Star Community Radio, Montgomery County's community radio station. If you enjoyed this recording, make sure to check out our past shows online at IRLoneStar.com or their respective video or podcast formats on YouTube, Google Play, or iTunes. If you have any questions regarding the show, either it being about sponsorships or questions for the host, contact the station manager at D-I-C-K at IRLoneStar.com or call the station at 936-647-3776. This show was recorded in downtown Conroe, Texas, at the Lone Star Community Radio Studio. And Lone Star Community Radio reserves all rights to this recording and images.